Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And we have some good news between this show and my other show, Shades of the Afterlife. We've just hit over 600 hours of episodes. Yes, I started 10 years ago, and I'm thrilled to have that news for you. In addition, Shades of the Afterlife has now become the number one most downloaded afterlife podcast in the world. So I'm really proud of that. And you might wonder what makes these two shows different. Like you'll see today, we spend time on this show just one-on-one with a guest. And over at Shades of the Afterlife, I'm more a reporter on the afterlife. You will hear some clips from some great guests, but also I'm telling you the latest and greatest of science and medicine and mediums and all kinds of things afterlife-wise. So if you're interested in that, just open your favorite podcast app and type in Shades of the Afterlife. So onto our show today, we have a favorite and a returning guest by the name of Scott Milligan. Scott is the world's foremost tutor of trance in the altered states and physical mediumship. I call him a young man, but he's got over 26 years sitting on behalf of our friends in the unseen world and loved ones. And for the past four years or so, we have been running courses online in medium demonstrations and all kinds of great things. But here we are in 2024, and I'm so proud that we're going to continue all of our online events. But he will also be hosting some in-person retreats along with Medium Dominic Bogue. You can find out what they have going on at togetherwithspirit.com. In fact, that'll be the website. Even if you listen to this sometime in the future, you can check that out. In addition, you can always go to wedontdie.com. And at the top of the page, there's a Scott Milligan page. So there you can also always find what's going on with Scott. Scott, my dear friend, welcome back to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so, so much. And congratulations on the milestone and how on a dark day that you had this idea and look how far it's come and look how many years it survived and it's going to live on after we are no longer here and in many years to come when people are watching this on this new invention they're going to say i wonder what sandra used to look like and then it's going to come back and it's going to be a new form of having a bookmark in history, isn't it? It is. You're funny because I'm a pit- picturing myself with white hair, missing a few teeth, and hello, Sandra Champlain here, way back in 2014. I know you're like me, and we will continue to serve. And it is grief that brings many of us into this world. And I thought today, Scott, you have been a guest on the show many, many times. And we haven't talked in a long time on this show. It's because I see you two or three times a week on Zoom. So I hadn't really thought it's time for our audience to catch up with you and and what's going on. And also there's always some new listeners that come in. And I thought today, perhaps we could talk about these seances and your time from going from believing to knowing and then you've got a good friend in the spirit world who was your circle leader and i was just so humbled a couple days ago when you mentioned 40 years 40 years he sat and created this space in this home circle so that the other world could speak and that is dedication and without him you wouldn't be the medium you are you wouldn't have witnessed what you have and i certainly wouldn't have never met you nor would this show be around so i'd like to just pass it over to you and just go wherever your soul guides you to go and talk about john talk about yeah wherever you'd like to go perfect thank you so much and let me just go back because i I smiled briefly because when you said i'm gonna be on here with white hair and missing teeth and (laughs) I'm Sandra. And then we've got our guest, Scott, and all of a sudden you pan and it'll be just an urn. (laughs) And some glasses sitting on top. That's what it's going to be. Because I can laugh about that. Because I know 
that the body must go, but everything that is good of your nature will live within the spirit world. But you're quite right. I need to begin our journey on telling you about John and the type of man he was in life and where he is now. Now, John kept a lot of his stories secret because he didn't want to give away his evidence. And as a medium, we should listen to the spirit world and say, John, do you know, I'm aware of this. And I remember saying to him, John, I'm aware of the word name brains. And he just smiled. And then he told me, and he took me back to the time of the war. During the war, his father and himself had been called up. And his father uh, was a very good soldier. However, he was in a situation where a bomb went off, threw him in the air, and as he landed, he was buried. And they were able to find his father by literally a bit of his boot was sticking out the earth, and they dug him out, and he was alive. But a part of him died that day. John always said, my father was never the same again. But during the war... He said, I got the name Brains because he was clever enough to know where the enemy was. And he said, a day when I was told I was a hero. And he said to me that he had the knowledge of how to use bombs. And he blew up a building with the enemy at the time, which were full of Germans, soldiers, and he blew it up and it came crashing down. And I think back then he got the award for as many people that were killed in one moment. And everyone spoke of him as heroes. And then he said, I started to cry. And I said, why? He said, because my actions has caused a huge a lot of people to go to the spirit world, but also for their family now to fall into grief. And he said, everyone cheered and wanted to buy me drinks. And all I wanted to do was go home and be with my family. He was a very strict man, ex-army. And he had two children with his wife, Geraldine. One was called Howard. And the youngest son was John Jr. Howard was showing every sign of success when it came to athlete. He was a very good runner, jumper, all-round person, and there was hopes for him to go to the Olympics. And at a young age, he travelled down to Hastings. And on the 5th of November, 1967, he was travelling from Hastings to Charing Cross, and Howard and his girlfriend and his best mate had their life come to an end on Hiver Green train crash incident. And unfortunately, almost 100 people lost their lives. John said to me one time, he remembered getting the knock and the policeman was standing there and told him the news and he said, it's not possible. And he had to go and ID his son's remains, and the girlfriend's and the best friend. He said he fell into a sense of grief where he didn't want to live anymore. He just wanted to lie down and sleep. And I think as I say this, it, it sounds familiar to many people here. But John being John, he was determined to try and understand and process what has taken place, get justice for his son. He actually believed that God was punishing him for what he did during the war. So he took other people's sons away and God was going to take his son away. But that's not true. But that's how he viewed it. It was his wife, Geraldine, who got him back to a place where he was able to go back to work. And unknown to him at this time his auntie 
was a voice medium. Uh, she was able to hear the spirits, but also create voices around her that were able to be heard. The family thought his auntie was strange, but he said it felt quite natural to investigate that. So he started looking at the possibility of making contact. And the way he started to look at this was from the book On the Edge of the Etheric by Arthur Finlay, which is a popular book within our community. It tells you about how Arthur Finlay himself investigated a direct voice medium by the name John Campbell Sloan. And without John Campbell Sloan, I don't think we'll have the wonderful Arthur Finlay College because through his evidence that gave Arthur Finley the sufficient proof, he bequeathed the house of Stansted Hall to the Spiritual National Union. So John looked at ideas of how to contact his son. And one of the most popular ones was to sit around a table and called it as table phenomena, or it was known as the parlor trick. Him and his wife would sit day in, day out, seeing if it was possible for the table to move. He said some days it moved, some days it did not. It could take 15 to 20 minutes before any kind of activity started to show. They used to play songs on the reel to reel. And then all of a sudden the table started to move. On one occasion, John told me that he was sitting there and his wife was opposite and his wife was showing early signs of MS, multiple cirrhosis, and it was slowly attacking her body and the table started to move in front and then all of a sudden the table disappeared and he believed that his wife had stood up from the wheelchair and grabbed the table and lifted it to the ceiling. So he turned up the light and there was Jerry sitting opposite in the chair, amazed that the table had disappeared. And as they looked up, it was pinned to the ceiling and it came crashing down and the leg broke off. He wanted to know if it was possible that if this was being done by a trick, be it through their own power or from the spirits, but back then, he was still having this argument, is it going to be wrong to contact the dead? Because back in those days, religion had a very strong hold. But he started to go to different places, and one of them was Belgrave Square, which was where the wonderful medium Doris Fisher-Stokes was demonstrating. And Doris Fisher-Stokes was a clairaudium, but she was also a stickler for... If you turned up late to the demonstration, she never liked that. And lo and behold, John was the last one with his wife to enter the demonstration. As they were entering the hall, which was packed to capacity, John and Geraldine were being moved towards the front because Geraldine was in the wheelchair. And Doris Fisher Stokes stopped and said, you, pointing to John, and gave him something like 38 names of his family members, which all was correct. And she said, one day the trumpets will lift and the dead will walk again in your front room. Go away and work at it. So there was always signposts that something was going to happen. But it was a chance meeting with the wonderful direct voice medium, Leslie Flint, and uh, Leslie Flint used to sit there and suck on a sweep and voices were heard around him. And they believed that he had two vocal cords and he was throwing his voice. So they made him hold water in his mouth or marbles and then seal his mouth up. And then the voices would come. They put microphones to his own vocal cords. And when the voices spoke, there was no noises coming from him. So he had the title of independent direct voice. John got a sit-in with Leslie Flint, with a few other people, and paid £2.50 per ticket. So that was £5 back then, and that was a lot of money. 
And he sat there and he reminisced and he said that Leslie would sit there and go, come along, Mickey, which was his spirit helper. I said, come along, Mickey, come and talk to them. And Mickey would come and talk and went straight to Geraldine. And Geraldine was sitting there and he said, oh, you've got a lot of power. And as Geraldine said, have I? And he said, oh, hang on, there's, a, there's someone pushing their way forward. And then all of a sudden, Mickey's voice changed and out came the voice of their son, Howard. She said, it sounded like him. The words that he used to use was being heard again in the order, the idiosyncrasy. She said, oh my God, it's my son. And then the voice of Howard said, come on, dad, talk to me. And you hear um, John on the, the, the reel to reel saying, oh my goodness, I'm a bit taken back from this. Oh my goodness. And I said to him, what was that like? And he said, imagine, imagine if you will, you're in the darkest and most painful nightmare. And then all of a sudden being ripped from that and being put in a place of paradise. He said, everything that was wrong with me was fixed with this moment of this voice talking. He said, it was my son. And not only did they bring the son, they brought the girlfriend of the son to talk. The parents of the girlfriend didn't want anything to do with what we know. And I felt John's pain. He said, I went round there and told them and they shouted back at me, which reminded me that not everyone is open to what we do. From that, the sittings became more frequent that's all they seemed to do they just wanted to make contact with their son and on one occasion that a lady from cardiff came down who was friends of geraldine and they decided to do a table sitting but by then the sitting had advanced and they had a reel to reel keep going to reel to reels that wasn't too long ago was it a reel to reel and they would record their sittings because back then it was quicker to speak it than to write it. And Geraldine opened the circle and the table started to move. And she said, is that you boys? And you would hear on the tape recorder Geraldine saying, the table has responded, yes. Then halfway through, the cat walked in. And as the cat walked in, this very old cat Geraldine said, be careful of the cat. The table has responded, yes. At the end of the sitting, the lady from Cardiff said, I've never heard my voice on the tape recorder before. And John said, let's play it back. And as they rewound it back, as they started to listen to each other, when Geraldine said, is that you boys? In Howard's voice, it responded, yes, mum, we're here. When it came to the cat, when she said, be careful of the cat, Howard's voice, as clear as I'm talking to you now, responds, I won't hurt Blackie, which was the name of the cat. I think from then, the proof just got more and more. So they decided to then convert the front room. But by then, they were told by the spirit world they were moving to Brighton. John said, I can't, my, my, my business is here. Our life is here in London. And lo and behold, a few months later, they were moved to Brighton or on the outskirts of Brighton in a place called Hove. The place was a ground floor flat and they decided to renovate the uh, front room with a red spotted carpet. Can you imagine it? Beautiful red with black spots and whatever else you can think of thrown into it because the spirit world said they need the color red within the room. So John said, fine, we'll get the carpet. And they decorated it. So they went off to a carpet shop in Hove and there was a young man there in his 30s. And he went over to speak 
to Geraldine and Geraldine hushed them away very quickly. You're not selling me that, go away. And they went round and they found the red carpet that they wanted. This young man came back. They explained to him that they needed it for their front room. This young man was short staffed this day and he agreed to go round there and measure the carpet space. So the young man went to this room where they were holding frequent sittings with the spirit world. And as he was measuring up the carpet, John came in with a cup of tea and said, Do you know, we hold seances here. And he said, I would often say that to people to see how they responded. And this young man just took it in his stride and said, oh, and John said, what do you think about that? And he said, I'm interested. I've been to some meetings. He said, would you want to be part of a table sitting? Would you want to sit? And he said, yes. So they decided to get the table out. And as they sat and the table began to move, John said, rocks are the strongest medium. And ordinarily it would knock into John. But this time it moved to the young man. He said, I've been waiting for you. And he remembered what Doris Fisher Stokes said 40 years beforehand. The trumpets will lift and the dead will walk again in your front room. The young man sitting there was Colin Fry. And he was the medium for that circle. Now, if Colin was in his 30s and the prophecy was in 40 years ago, it showed that the other world had already prepared the development before Colin was born. And that's why John, without any flicker, he sat with his wife to create good power. Within 21 weeks, they sat with Colin for one hour a week. So it's 21 hours. Colin went from being a person who was interested to being the materialization medium and having the dead materialize in the front room. And the prophecy came about. Just want to ask a question. When you said they sat for 40 years, could you just give us like what that would look like, John and Geraldine being together? Of course, they would sit and they would black out the, the window. So if you could imagine this room, what they used to use was their front room and they would black out the window. So no natural light came in. So if the other world wanted to create a light or anything like that, it wasn't a passing car or anything like that at all. They would have two chairs in the middle and in between the two chairs, there will be a table to the side of that will be another table, which will have the tape recorder on and it will be very basic. They would sit, be quiet for a few minutes to settle themselves down. They would then open traditionally in prayer and then they would welcome the spirit close. But then they'll forget about the, the spirit world. They'll just sit for the table without any pressure by saying, come on or this or that. The table would just respond because there was no demands. I knew a husband and wife that sat for 15 years and every time they sat at the table, the husband would say, come on, move, and all that business. Come on, move, we're giving you everything. And it didn't move at all. And on this last day, he said, do you know what? If you're not going to move, we're not going to do it anymore. Nothing happened in that sitting. He said, we've given you 15 years of our lives and all that business. We're off, probably off to the pub. And as they stood up, and walked out the room. The table then walked independently behind them, knocking in. Now, if that was me, I would go and pick up the axe and turn it into firewood. I said, you had your chance. However, it showed them the moment we stopped demanding it, that's when the freedom comes from the spirit world. So they for... very basic. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Did they sing or anything? I know in home Sometimes circles they did. these days, or listen to music. Sometimes I did. John used to play me some of the music. And that's why to this day now, I cannot listen to the piano version of Green Sleeves because that's what he used to play for me. And I would sit there and it was like nails on a chalkboard. And 
when it got to the end of the song, he was hit rewind, yeah, blah, 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 and then click, and then it'll play again. And the recording was so worn, it would crackle, it would just go, blah, 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 and I'm thinking, please break, please break. And I had to say to him, do you know what, John? It's time. Put it to bed. And he said, yes, but it worked. It worked back then and it'll work again. I said, let's replace it with a bit of Rihanna. <laughs> let's move it forward. Uh, You're so I, funny. I just remember it. Going, blah, 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 blah. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Because I know you and I are passionate about these home circles can start again. And I think there's probably some going on out there now but keeping them quiet but to get people excited about what's possible so continue on with your story if you would um, we're just meeting now the young colin fry carpet guy and um yeah what happened because eventually well, you get pulled into this as well oh, i get sucked in um so basically uh because colin was showing rapid unfoldment back in 1990 to 1991. I have to also note at this time that our world had two very great physical mediums, one being Gordon Higginson and the other one being Leslie Flint. Gordon Higginson had had or was approaching a series of strokes and Leslie Flint was being diagnosed with lung cancer. So we had two of our big hitters preparing their final years. And Gordon passed to the spirit world in 1993 and Leslie in 94. So I think the spirit world was already preparing for uh, them leaving for someone else to take on the responsibility. Colin was showing rapid development and they didn't want people to know who Colin was, because with Leslie Flint, people would knock at all hours of the night and saying, I'm in grief and I need your help. And little Leslie was so soft hearted, he couldn't deny people that sitting. His partner, Bram, yes, was like, no, 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 you need your rest. Come back when the sun is up. So they changed Colin's name to Lincoln which was like a kind of anagram of his name. So they used all the letters, mixed it all up, and he was known as the medium Lincoln. And Colin, in the early days, was very fast at going off. He used to have a Oriental man that spoke through him called the Mandarin. And the Mandarin would then set out the course of what was going to take place. But the first real voice that kind of identified themselves with Dr. Alexander Bell, which was the inventor of the telephone. And Alexander Bell was being used in how to communicate. He had the mind of making the wires in this world and in the spirit world, he was being used his talent to see if they can control Colin in a certain way. Colin was showing very quick signs of, of progression uh, but I also need to add at this moment because people will know of it now I was not there so I cannot fully comment but a coin has two sides we're having this acceleration but then we have a dark time and that was a seance which was done in Norfolk and John told me this one and Colin verified Colin was incredibly ill he was recovering from a stroke and he didn't want to do a seance, but he had people traveling from great distances for the demonstration. And John said, you need to slow down. And I don't think you should do tonight's sitting. And Colin said, you know what? I just need to get it done. Then I can rest. And he reaffirmed the pressures that are put on people. And he went to the seance. And if you could imagine, there was like a half circle round Colin. And then there was an outer ring round that. The light bulbs had these wooden boxes put over. So if the light came on, it wouldn't light up the room. Very quickly in these early days, the phenomena started. And the trumpets, as they went up, 
it knocked into people, which is unheard of. The trumpet would normally gracefully move around the room. And John knew quite quickly something's not right. And then all of a sudden, the lights came on. Many people in the outer ring saw Colin in the middle of the room with his hand out. And the trumpet was seen to be in his hand. When the light came on, you saw Colin fall back onto John. People on the inner ring saw the same thing, but Colin was off the ground and the trumpet was above his hand. And as he fell back, he started to hemorrhage. So he always had this stigma that he was out of the chair. But the College of Psychic Studies, along with the Noah's Ark Society, plowed a lot of money into investigating, first of all, the straps that restrained him and what actually happened. And the straps that restrained him, one of them had teeth marks in, which the impressions of Colin's teeth did not match the straps. The other one looked like it had been frozen with nitrate and then hit very quickly with a psi knife. And they said that's physically impossible without actually cutting his skin. The other world said, as their example, was that because he was under weather, that they lost control. And that's why with the seance, my little lovers, we've got to be careful. Careful in the sense that you sit when you feel it is right to sit. You'll never get hurt by the spirit world. And I need to stress that very, very quickly. But this is part of his development. It is a staple within his development. And if you Google him and you're going to say, actually, that Scott is telling you this, but he didn't speak about that. So I think it's a very important point just to add in. But the circle was committed because they had had their proof. There was a time, uh, John would tell me, that he would have his son materialize and talk to him. But at this point, Geraldine was becoming very, very unwell. And she had to withdraw from the circle. And on the Sunday night, she was bed bound. And it was very clear that she wasn't going to see the morning. John stood at the end of her bed, along with Pat. And they watched how they said that you saw this light leave her. And Pat said, it's not going to be long now. And John said, you go home. Let me sit with my wife. By the time she got home, the phone rang. He says, it is a great joy that my wife has now joined my son. And Pat said, are you well? Do you need me? And he said, I'm OK. I'm OK. I will see you on Tuesday for circle. So Tuesday came, the circle was broken. They tied Colin to a chair and they wheeled Geraldine's wheelchair into the room. And as they sat, out came this wonderful woman, not bound in a chair, not had any illness, and said to John, you can get rid of that. And the chair flew back towards the door and said, I'm fine. I'm well. And John said, who met you? And she said, Howard, of course. My mother was there. My sister was there. Oh, John. Heaven does exist. And I remember him telling me that. And I said, how do you feel? And he said, how can I be upset? How can I be upset? This woman was confined to a chair and now is walking with my son. How can I be upset? I'm just frustrated now because I'm here. And Geraldine said, you need to continue the work. You've got more work to do. We've got things to do over here when it's time you come over. So then the circle carried on and John made that promise. Same time, same place, same people and harmony. Now, moving swiftly on, if I may, many of you know of my coming into this form of work, so I'm not going to bore you with that. 
But what I will bore you with was the first time I met John. Being expected to meet someone who everyone seemed to speak about. This lovely man with a very bushy moustache, which is pure white, his hair brushed in a nice way, sitting in his kitchen with the cat Sooty. And if you could imagine, he's sitting in like a chair like this and stroking the cat. So you can see it's like James Bond as you walk in. He said, oh, you're Scott and all of this. And we've heard a lot about you. And I have to tell you this story, and you've probably heard it before, about the Ouija board. Now, a lot of people don't like it. If there's fear, don't touch it. If there's interest, then respect it. And he said, I think we need to do the board. And I said to him, board? And he said, the Ouija board. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not touching that. And he said, do you think it's going to hurt you? As it was slid onto the table. And I said, yes. And he picked it up and he hit me with it. And if you could imagine... I've gone from being very peaceful, very respectful to 100 miles an hour. I wanted to kill him. I wanted him to beat him to death with that Ouija board and turn him into a message. And he said, now put your finger on the glass. And it spelt out Milligan's sit very, very quickly. So I think really that's the first time that I started to get independent phenomena that reassured me that there's an intelligence behind it. So what story would you like to hear? I just want to tell those of you who are listening right now or watching on YouTube, I have a full interview with Scott that he goes into how he got called in. And um, it's fantastic. So just look in the description below and you can click on that episode to hear how he got pulled in. More of that story. Scott, I'd like to know, because you've sat with Colin and other physical mediums as well, what are some of those things that you've witnessed that have taken you from believing or hope in the afterlife to really knowing that move the needle, really? Because now we have all been through grief and you were a young man, I know then, and hadn't experienced what you've experienced now. But what are some of those things that you witnessed? I think the ha-ha moments. I think sometimes it's it's the hysterical ones that I remember the most. We were at John's house and the person above the seance room was laying a new floor. And so we're sitting in a room. Colin's restrained to the chair. We've examined the room so we knew what was in the room at the time. And as we're sitting there, all you kept on hearing was a from above, so as knock, they were knock, knock. floorboards, yeah, the hammer like noise, and knock, uh, knock. I thought it was really funny. So we're singing away, and the more we sang, the louder the, the knocking became. And Felix R. Mackenzie materialized, and he was a doctor that wrote the possibility of the transplant of a human heart in Edinburgh, been in the spirit world for some time. And he was talking to us and he kept on hearing us and he was getting distracted. And he said, I can't work in these conditions. And he disappeared. And then upstairs you heard, dong, 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 boom. And in, in the room that we're sitting, you had boom. And then you heard, mm, thing, 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 upstairs. And Felix came back and said, Felix, what did you do? He said, I took away their hammer. He went upstairs, took the hammer and brought it into the seance room. And he said, the work that we do is too important. The window of opportunity shrinks every moment. We have to achieve what we set out to. So we continued. By the time that Felix had completed what he needed to do, he said, I must go. And then upstairs you heard... And he took the hammer back after the work had done. And I thought that was a moment because a physical object was being held by a physical person that disappeared and then landed into another room without a single door being opened. 
So first of all, that's one of them. Second of all, was that the instructions of Magnus, who was the main voice of the diamond, he instructed that you would hear the chair drop. And we were to end the sitting and call Colin back. So chair dropped, excuse me, we started Carl, Carl, Colin, Carl, Carl, Colin, Colin, all of that business. No response. John, what do you want us to do? Give him a few more moments. Carl, Carl, Colin, Colin, Carl, all of that business. He didn't respond. What do you want us to do? He said, turn on the light. And as the light turned up, there was the chair. Perfectly in the middle, but there was no medium. And we're hunting the medium. So we go behind the curtain, can't find him. Behind the sofa, can't find him. Is he pinned to the ceiling? No, he's not up there. Where is he? And you could hear a noise coming from the locked door, the other side of it. The key goes in, and as you open the door, light is now pouring into the room because there's a window on the other side. And underneath the window, there's Colin, trussed up like a turkey. How did he get from being in a sealed room to outside? You can't do it. So these little moments were, oh, my God. And that started to move me from believing to know him. There was another time that I was traveling to Hayward Teeth, which is a town next to mine. Five minutes, that's where Colin lived. And we were going to speak to Magnus. And we were allowed to ask questions very similar to what we do on a Friday night with the questions and answers with our friend Eric. And I thought, oh, it's going to be silly because I need to ask a question. But I don't want to sound silly in front of all the people that sit more often than I do. So I started to formulate a question in my mind. I said, oh, Magnus, I'm going to ask this. And I thought, that's silly. Magnus, I'm going to ask this. And in my head, that's how I sound. So I started to travel on the train. I thought, no, I'm going to ask Magnus this one. And then all of a sudden, I get to the meeting room. I sit in there and everyone's going, hi, hi. I forgot my question. And so I've now started to panic. And then I thought, I'm going to think of this question. And as it came to ask questions, it's like being picked for the gym. You're going to be the last one. So you're sweating. And you're not relaxed because you think you're going to be silly. And I went, hello, Magnus. And he said, my dear boy, the answer to your first question is this. Answer to your second question is that. And he said, and the answer to your third question we heard you on your choo-choo train. And that then catapulted me even further. This is happening. But the one that got me, I think really, besides my personal communication from my sister, who I didn't know of, and having her materialize, embracing her as a young girl, of four years old, even though that she passed when she was a baby. She grew up in the spirit world and feeling her, knowing her, hearing her, that started to really set in that, oh my God, this is real. You didn't but know I, you had a sister, right? No, no, she was the born. Sister, the sister. Yeah. So my, my sister Emma was born before myself and passed very quickly afterwards. And there was a lot of trauma that followed within the family obviously i cannot speak to, for anyone who's had children go to the other world but for me i really fall out with god however we see god to be as eric would say because it's unnatural and i find it really really hard to accept this but it happens and i was very lucky to have my sister introduce herself and the voice that came came back just after my father passed to the spirit world because i was angry i was so angry that my father died in the way he died and the spirit world didn't fully tell me that something was bad was about to happen so i was really angry and as i was really in a bad place my sister's voice returned to me and said, 
You've had him for 35 years. My turn. And that anger left me because I've had him for Christmas. I've been able to hug him at Christmas and listen to his voice. And my sister Emma, the only child in the spirit world of my father, has probably sat there and gone, excuse me, I'm here. And we've all ignored her. So that anger that I had had melted away. So with Colin, I think the ha-ha moments became when I was part of other people's messages. There was this little old lady. She must have been in her 70s. I want to say 78. I could be wrong, but she's in her 70s. Her husband materialises. She's not interested in talking to her husband. Her husband's brought the parrot that used to be a family pet. The parrot has flown out the cabinet and flying around the seance room. And she's, oh, pretty boy, pretty boy, coming back and all of this. Husband's trying to talk. She's not interested in the husband. She's talking to Polly, parrot, whatever the name was, which was a family pet. So we cannot measure grief of who we want to talk to. I'm a proud father of, oh my goodness, now six, 11, 13 babies. 13 babies. Do you they need are... to explain that they're furry yes, <laughs> friends? <laughs> I have 13 children. I've got 11 rabbits and two cats. They're my babies. They're my world. They come first. Then Darren. Darren's down the line. But I was devastated because I had five stillborns all at once. And I was absolutely bereft. I couldn't face it. And I felt so much pain. I feel that for an animal. I can never imagine what it must be for a mother or for a father or for anyone. Can't imagine it. But my dad's looking after those little peanuts over there. And along with my sister, along with all my hamsters, they're all they're going to be fine. So for me, who would I like to speak to first? Obviously, it will be my father, then my sister, my nans, my granddads. But I would also like to squeeze my animals. I would love to have them and have bunny therapy and have all the little babies come over and be a part of it. But in a seance, that happens. I've had a lady hold her pet rat before. Another time, a lady next to me called Hazel Hunt, she was sitting there and earlier that morning, her cat was euthanized. And her uncle Ted walked out the cabinet, went over to her who was sitting next to me, took my hand off of her, because we always used to sit and hold hands, because it was a nice, comfortable thing to do, took my hand off without fumbling, took her hands, and then the cat materialized from the uncle, landed on her lap, jumped on my lap. And you know how cats do this, like kind of claw and scratch? That was happening to my kneecap. The cat jumped on the floor. The spirit child ran out of the cabinet and said, get back here. Uncle Ted's still talking. The cat's running around the room like a lunatic, like a kid on sugar. The kid's trying to catch the cat. And this was normal. It's normal because you feel the love within the room. And that's the important thing. Death destroys us. Death brings that dark, unbelievable suffocation of grief. And the reason we feel so rubbish is because we have loved someone truly love someone and that's what comes it's like the sun being chased by the curtain of night when their sun has set this darkness ascends on us and it's overbearing but then when you hear a voice or you have these moments a little star appears and then the moon appears and then that fades and the sun rises again and you learn to breathe you learn to live. And that's what happens in the seance room. 
it's love. These people who, who play around with it, and I have to say, don't do seances as I remember, they're more for the phenomena. But we sat for the voices. We sat to bring a loved one back into the room. Nothing you can say to me, nothing you can do to me, will ever shake me from this rock. I know I'm going to see everyone again. It's just going to take a little time. Do I, am I scared of death? I'm not scared what happens after death. I'm a bit worried about how I'm going to go. I yeah, don't me wanna, too. <laughs> I don't want to electrocute myself making some crumpets or something like that and blow whatever hair I've got left off my head and then off I go. That's just awful. You know, I always say I want to go dramatic, um, you know, for people to remember me. I don't know, go like Elvis on the toilet. And um, people remember Scott for making that grunt noise and then off I go. Oh, you'll leave people with a story, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's talk about how you witness this, because there are times that a red light is on. A lot, yeah. most of it's held in the dark, so you're hearing things. And this is happening in, in private homes. This isn't somebody charging you $200 to come witness this. These are private citizens in private homes where this is taking place. Could you talk a little bit about what you maybe have seen with a little red light on? Yeah. And your stories are just wonderful and so comforting to know that our people are with us and also our animals and love never dies. Absolutely. But before I go with that, can I be controversial and explain the reason? Sure. I think it's important. Back in 2000, it all went a bit wrong for the movement for physical mediumship because some silly so-and-so decided to fake a demonstration. It was all the scandal and it sent a shockwave through. And people like myself had to come out fighting. We had to come out and say, we need to educate as much as possible. A seance is about a loved one, not about the phenomena. If the phenomena happens, it's got to be intelligent. If objects appear, it's got to have meaning. And if money is to change hands, we've got to ensure that whatever happens, this is coming from the spirit world, not through ego. So I got myself in a bit of trouble because I came out going, this is how, blah, blah, blah. And I was met by a lady who will remain nameless, who was very good at drawing the faces of people who are in the other world, a spirit portrait artist. And she came with all steam from her and said, the spirit world's an intelligence. They don't need darkness. And I said, you're absolutely right. But the medium's body needs that darkness to produce the energy that helps with the phenomena. You, I hear you are a spirit artist. And she said, yes. I said, I hear you're a very good one. She said, yes. And I thought, no, we go there then. And I said, so how do you work? Do you use a piece of paper? Yes. Do you use pencils? I use crayons and everything. And she started giving me the regalia of what she uses. And I said, the spirit world's an intelligence. They don't need all of that. But your body needs the paper and the pencil to express what is moving through you. So please respect at the moment that people will have to sit in the dark. But we are moving towards the light. So that's the reasons why at the moment, because our body needs it. But there are times when the other world, when we're patient, when we have the opportunity, the other world will say, it is time. And one of these occasions, I remember, Colin was behind a curtain. He had been searched, as we always do, restrained, as we always do. If it's private or public, we would always tie him down. We only tied him down because we quite enjoyed it, but we tie him down nonetheless. As we were sitting there, the voice appeared and said, put on the light. And the light was low, but we were still able to see each other. And there was no trickery, there was no wires. And the cabinet curtains parted and out came a baby's head. And this baby's head came out so far, it had no shoulders, but it was just the head. 
the eyes opened and it blinked and the facial expressions changed. Now, back then, they didn't have the, the dolls what could do that. This was a baby. This was a living, breathing baby. And then it just evaporated. But then hands would appear through the curtain. So you would see this hand come out, but then it would go further than someone's arm. It was like two meters long and it would move and come around the room. Or occasionally, if they couldn't put on the red light, they would glow themselves. So this hand would start to glow and move across the room, physical that all of us can see. It wasn't an optical illusion. We saw this hand glowing. But then there would be a foot walking along, but the foot would go in a different direction to the hand, which was physically impossible. It wasn't someone just doing that, stretching out. They would move in separate directions. And bear in mind, the ceiling was a Victorian house. So you're looking at three and a half to four meters high, which is two of me on top. The hand's going up to the ceiling, knocking on the ceiling while the foot is carrying on bouncing around the room. So it isn't someone sitting on a ladder. It's impossible. There was other times when Colin was giving healing in the trance states and his finger went to someone's ear and it was actually a lady called Bianca, went behind her ear like this and you saw the finger go through and out the other side. And they were using the energy from the seance to give healing. And then it would go up the nose and come out the side of the eye or whatever it may be. But it was very normal that they would operate through people. And that was Dr. Offington, who would also materialize sometimes in the seance and sometimes in the trance states. But that is just one of the, or a couple of the examples. And another one was in Australia, and the medium was restrained and the curtains in front and the red light came on and they started to put a hand under the curtain. And you think well, it could be the medium. It's got the hand three and the, the hands underneath the curtain. And then about, I would say, six to seven foot high, another hand came over the top. Now, the medium is only five foot nothing. So very small. I'm a giant next to this one. And both hands are moving and then the curtain starts to lift and you then start to see the medium's legs. Still, the medium is seated. You see the medium's hands still tied, but these two separate hands would appear in light for all of us in the room to see. I think, ladies and gentlemen, what I tell you is my story. And you may think, Scott, this is not possible. I have no reason to lie to you. But I do say, believe not a word I say until you experience it yourself, wherever that may be. But there are other occasions when the light came on and you saw what looked like white cloth pour from the medium's mouth down to about 30 to 35 centimetres, and then it came back up and went over the head and then in through the left ear and disappeared. And that was impossible. And that happened in front of 30 people and I was up close. Now, bear in mind, I do have bad eyes, one good eye, one bad eye, but I'm looking like a hawk. I can see this. And so can everyone else who can verify this. And th these are just steps of the phenomena. Could you talk a little bit about, I know you've spoken to us in your class about this and other times that you've spoken, but your, let me back up. There's a lot of great stories of mediums in the past with all these wonderful materializations, there was a point in your development that the spirit world, it almost, as I remember the story, you got the choice to go for those phenomena with lights on, seeing the ectoplasm. There's pictures I've seen of you with the ectoplasm. 
or is it more important to bring loved ones voices through? And I know you, but if you could just talk about why, when you demonstrate or what your priority is and your spirit team. Okay. I think really I need to just give you a bit of background because with myself, the phenomena became very aggressive. And what I mean by aggressive, I, when I used to sit, the sofa that two people would sit on would be pushed quite violently back or will start to tip on one side and down on the other and rock like a seesaw. Trumpets would lift, the bells would ring really loud, and there was knocking on all the walls, running across the ceiling. It was a very uncontrolled condition. But I had really good sitters who gave me a lot of power. And it was John's wish back in, before he passed, which was in july of 2011 that if he could see the ectoplasm through me and i think the other world knew he was getting ready to transition so they threw everything at me and we were able to put on the light and we had this pouring of phenomena and in those days i was moving towards working in a professional capacity and I was being taken to the Arthur Finley College to demonstrate and part of the conditions of working at the Arthur Finley College in the seance was to show a form of phenomena so I had a lot of the seances at a certain point they say turn on the light and keep the light on now a lady who's just recently left the college by the name of Tanya Smith, she can verify this for me, along with the 60 people who were present. Exoplasm poured from the nostrils, from the mouth, and from my belly down to the floor, and it rolled and creeps. And at the end of it, they formed the basics of a hand that started to walk across the floor. And it was about three meters away from me. So Tanya was asked to take the key and unlock the door of the library at the Arthur Finley College and to open the door gently to allow natural light to come in, which she did. The ectoplasm was able to stay out and continue to move, even though it started to evaporate a little bit, but it was still there. I was becoming very popular with the tutors, but I had to do 11 test seances each time achieving what they set out. And I remember this lady coming up to me and I was, I, my ego was getting very big and I loved the college and I loved the attention back then. And this lady came up to me and said, I've seen you a few times now. Brilliant. Love it. And I thought, oh, thank you in my most humble voice and she said but it's not bringing my son back and it hit me it was like a knife a hot knife stabbing me in the stomach and I thought oh my god and I actually felt her pain and then I sat there and I thought about it and the spirit world gave me the choice continue down this path and you will show the phenomena but if you want loved ones, which is going to take up the most of the power, we need to go a different course. This was said to our home circle. And as a circle, we decided quite quickly the voice of a loved one. And literally like overnight, I crept back into darkness. It was like someone has slowed down my development. But then the voices started to come and the voices were recognized. And unfortunately, I then got damaged. And what I mean by that is that someone acted inappropriately and I got burnt. And then on one occasion in a seance, I won't say where it is because it was an accident. I think it's wise. 
that the trumpet went up in the air and it was floating around the room and I was the medium and my little friend, my younger friend who brings the loved ones, I uh, was preparing for the voice and said to the circle leader, who is not my circle, by the way, who was the owned the venue, and say, could you put up the music, please? Put off the music. And they couldn't find the music, so they decided to turn on the light. The trumpet, what people saw, was like a cord, what was attached to the center of my stomach, out to about two meters, connected to the trumpet, while it was in the air, if move violently away from the light to the left hand side drop the trumpet and suck back into the cabinet and that set my development back so in the gooder days when we probably first met the voices of the loved ones were strong and people got more communication and now they're only whispers because i need to go back into the stable home circle and really got to stop demonstrating to focus on myself so I can get strong. But that's when the spirit world said, you're going to stop for two years. And I said, I can't, I can't. This is my job. This is my job. This is the promise we made. And they said, no, you're going to stop and the world is going to hold its breath. And we were like, no, it's not. And then we started to hear about COVID. And then the world stopped for two years it still goes on and that's the problem so the choice was made back then loved ones or the circus trick of phenomena that's not going to get a mum up in the morning no i've sat in your seances oh i probably 16 17 times it's been quite a number and there's glow in the dark luminescent tape on some of the things. So there is phenomena. You do see the trumpet moving or hula hoop moving. And there's a plaque that is glow in the dark. I've seen children's hands. I've heard many things. I've been touched. I've been sprayed with a little water gun too. But I have witnessed the loved ones coming through and one of our events that we had had in Florida, I remember a real skeptical man there with his wife and he got to talk to his daughter again. And there were words, he had a nickname for her that nobody knew, couldn't find that on the internet. And she got to speak to his dad and he was sitting on the right side of me and squeezed my hand and his life forever changed. So although people sitting with you may not see faces and all that, everyone whether you get the communication or not i i know everyone feels the presence of the spirit world and you can feel these strong connections with the loved ones and they're so special and like you said you always say this don't believe what i say <laughs> but you have to experience it for yourself and that's the truth and i know scott and i are are good friends now after all these many years. And I've seen what's possible. And not too long ago, I interviewed Scott and we created what's called the home circle course, teaching people how to sit for their own development. And then also, if you wanna start one of these home circles and, and see what's possible, follow in the steps of John Austin and many others. I feel Scott that Enough time has passed. I know everybody's busy these days and we all have our technology and we're so quick to check on our uh, email and text messages and stuff. But having that time with COVID and being in lockdown or being away from people, I think many of us got tapped into nature, slowing down. So do you feel like me that there's people interested in maybe starting this and and having experiences and offering themselves quite humbly to the spirit world saying i'm here use me how can i serve i think absolutely i think the world has changed but also we have changed i i can only speak for myself i love lockdown i loved it because i was able to get up when i wanted i go to bed when i needed to but i sat with myself I sat with myself and I was able to hear the birds for the first time 
and not having to rush. I was able to see spring come into life and the world was quiet. There was a lot of fear because we didn't know what was going on. So it was a good time to look at self. But now the world has changed. COVID is still going on there. I've had it five times up until this day. I'll probably get it six or seven more times. But for me, I think the other world are now calling. At this very moment, which is in January 2024, there is a war. There's wars going on. Two wars. I think it's going to get worse. I think the other world is preparing us to be worse. Absolutely devastated that people are losing their lives on all sides. War only creates graves and grief. So the need now is quite big. So mediums are now being called to serve in the time of great need. And I think the acceleration of seances, demonstrations are going to be called because there's so many people grieving. Look at Gaza. How many people have passed in Gaza? How many people have passed in Russia, Ukraine, Israel? Not talking about the ones who have passed in natural death or accident or murder. That still goes on. So the other world are getting this massive influx. So there is a huge grief and anger. So I think now more than ever, the spirit world are going to say, we need to help prove that life is sacred, but life continues. So if you're interested in mediumship, you're probably finding this itch of your gift starting to develop. And so that you can be the voice of those who are voiceless. So I do feel it's now more than ever, we need to be looking at spirituality development and development as groups of people that can fight a spiritual war. And that spiritual war is the lie about death. Lie about death. But everyone who's passed in the war I take comfort to know that they don't remember that. I remember listening to a recording of Leslie Flint of a soldier who was forced to go out of the trench and run towards the enemy. And he said, I ran. And then as I was running, people weren't staring at me. I ran past the enemy who didn't look at me. I realized I didn't have my gun. And then as I went past the enemy, the battlefield faded away and I started to run in a street where everyone was looking at me. Everyone was pretty, clean, handsome. And he said, this is a funny place. And someone shouted out, oi, where are you running to? And he said, and that was the voice of my father. So he didn't know that he had transitioned. So I don't know what happened to his body. His body may have experienced horrendous pain, but he didn't. So all those people who have passed in the most horrific manner, it's the body that went in the pain, not the person that you love. Thank so you for that. I think more than ever now. Yes. On Fridays, I just want to invite everyone it's not every friday because of course scott deserves some travel time and some off time but very often we have what's called in the arms of eternity that we start that scott let, uh, leads us through a gentle sitting for healing and then there's an experimental demonstration of trance mediumship i know many of our listeners and viewers right now have heard the voice of mr eric and anyone is welcome to attend you can leave a donation you can come for free but just come you can always find them at we don't die.com on that Scott Milligan page that I talked about. Scott, last, I just want to ask you about uh, coming together with our friend Dominic Bogue, the medium, and you've created several retreats. We're recording this in 2024. And I know there's people listening now, probably in 2027. <laughs> 
but you're yeah, going to keep got, got my urn now <laughs> you got your urn and i'm losing my teeth and my white hair but if you just want to talk a little bit about why you've come together and of course this year you have events in massachusetts in new orleans in brighton england in barlow in the netherlands and there'll be more in the future together with spirit.com is the website for that. But would you want to talk a little bit about the genesis, the idea behind these retreats and what happens? First of all, I need to mention that we've all done silly things, haven't we? We've all been immature at times. And back in my younger life, I knew Dominic and I knew him to be a rebel. And then We've gone our separate ways from the retreats. And then this extraordinary man gave Darren a reading. And he did not know who Darren was. Darren went in with a pseudo name. We got someone else to book it. And this young man gave me a hundred percent proof of my father. Darren, poor love, he didn't get any kind of communication really from his loved ones. It was all for me. This boy, man, sorry, Dominic, he is registered blind. He's only got a, a very small percentage of his sight. So he couldn't see our faces or because it was all done by phone. I wasn't there. And he gave Darren absolute proof of my father's existence. So first of all, I can credit him for being absolutely outstanding. To test him again, I booked my mother through someone else under a different name, a different phone number. And lo and behold, he gave absolute proof, even down to the street that the cafe was on when the attack happened. So for me, absolutely incredible man. And he's still... Oh, it's going to make me sick. He's still younger than me. So he's got many years ahead of him. And he invited me on one of his retreats. And I loved what he did. But I wanted to bring a bit what I could bring to the table, which is like the fun with the bingo and things like that. So we then started to put our heads together along with a couple of us. And we want to do retreats where people can feel safe, People can feel immersed in an experience where you are free to let go. Many tutors will destroy you. That doesn't sit well with our, for us. If it doesn't work, a tutor should look at you and then realize what is not working. Instead of saying that's rubbish, we should say it didn't work because of this. So it's an opportunity for us to look at you and see where you're, where it may be going slightly to the left and bring you back on track. But these retreats were made to be a buffet of ideas. So for me, I bring the associated, tra well, trance and associated phenomena. Dominic brings the mental mediumship. Josephine, when she's with us, brings the spirit portrait art. Yolanda, when she's with us, connects with the power and the trance states. Sonia Ronaldi does the ITC communication. And we start to bring ideas to people because not everyone wants to sit with me, but they want to do art instead. But it gives you an opportunity. If you don't like me, you're only here for a little while with me and then you move on to your next tutor and so on. And we try and share what we can. When you come on a retreat, what you're doing is you're feeding off the psychic power of the tutor. So I will try and pour into you whatever I can. And that's the whole idea of, of the retreats. They're wonderful. Ooh. And you get to sit in seance with you. Yes, you can. And nobody presses, pushes you to do that. But if you'd like to, you can. And you can meet Mr. Eric through your trans mediumship as well. And Mr. Daniel and who knows who else. The thing is, whether you're alone or you have someone to attend with, I'm always someone who travels alone. And don't let being solo stop you from attending i tell you you meet the best friends of your life that you'll have forever and it is so rare to have people that you can actually talk about life after death and living a powerful life and most everyone has shared grief so 
you're in a good place with good people and good environments. And whether or not you want to explore mediumship, you get an opportunity to try different things, whether it's art, whether it's evidential mediumship, you just get to learn and explore. The one thing you do leave is really feeling comfortable comforted and inspired of the reality of the afterlife and there is a mediumship demonstration that you get to be a part of and you get to see how close loved ones are and how real all of this is so you can go to togetherwithspirit.com and see what's upcoming scott we've not really gone over time because we can listen to you forever what no. Final words would you like to say before we wrap up this episode together? I think really, once again, as we turn that page of life, I don't know your story. I don't know how you have lived. But those who have fallen into grief, I know what that feels like. Whose grief is more or less, that's something we will never discuss. But what I can tell you is that your loved one, whoever it may be, is there with you. They haven't lost their life. They've just lost their voice. They've lost the ability to show themselves clearly. But it doesn't stop them waving their hands in front of you when you're in your despair. So when you are having that absolute dark moment, sit, close your eyes, and think of the happiest time. That sends this light into that darkness, and they step close to you. The tingle around your head is them. If your loved one has been taken to the spirit world through murder, Don't let the title murder define a lifetime of happiness. So, for instance, my father was going to be murder. The court saw it differently. But in all sense of word, his life was ended by someone else or by five other people. And a lot of people said, that's Frank who was murdered. No, no, no. This is Frank who lived. And a medium should tell you not how they died, but how they lived. So don't allow titles to stick. You will see them again. We will meet in the spirit world. Some of us may go sooner. Some may drag our heels. Some may go dramatically and some may go peacefully. But whoever's the last, flick off the switch as our job is done. And let's have a party in the spirit world. Scott, thank you so much for being our guest again and today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm like a bad smell. I like to return. (laughs) Oh, it's just perfect. And for our listener or our viewer, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Again, you can go to wedontdie.com. You can click on the Scott Milligan page there. Come join Scott and I for one of our monthly classes. You can learn about trance and the altered states. Beautiful time just to learn to quiet that mind and blend with that unseen world again you don't have to want to be a medium to do this but we all have friends and loved ones in that unseen world so just to slow down and feel their presence it's a beautiful thing of course we have our friday in the arms of eternity we have lots of other things Uh, scott offers sitting in the power hours good opportunity to recharge your battery that's what i call it anyways yeah always some wonderful events also the together with spirit events there's lots there so again we don't die.com click on the scott page also while you're there while you're there you can go to the sunday gathering page each week we offer a free non-denominational gathering it's filled with inspiration and joy and empowerment and there's a medium demonstration included in each and every one so in closing my name is sandra champlain i'm always so delighted to be your host on we don't die radio i do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is so important your loved ones truly are around 
There are miracles that we can witness and it takes us being on the court, being active and looking for them. Don't wait for things to happen. As my mom says, make them happen. So I really want to thank you for listening or for watching and we'll see you again soon.